Hey, welcome back to Cool Classics. Today we're going to take a look at the life and career of Ken Weatherwax, best known for playing Pugsley on the original TV series The Addams Family, but there's more to his story. He's got some freaky family connections. I found some cool clips. Here we go. He was born Kenneth Patrick Weatherwax, September 29th, 1955, in Los Angeles, California. His parents were William McAllister Weatherwax and Marjorie Keeler. There are not any pictures online of his mother and father or of himself while he was a baby, and I'll explain why later. His mother Marjorie was also an actress, and she starred in movies in the 1940s, such as Girl from Avenue A and Henry Aldrich for President. And her sister was Ruby Keeler, a famous actress from the 30s and 40s, best known for playing Peggy Sawyer in the 1933 film 42nd Street. Dancing feet on the avenue, I'm taking you to 42nd Street. Ruby was also married to a fellow actor and a famous singer. You may have heard of him. His name, Al Jolson. Who are you? For your information, I'm Dorothy Wayne, one of the featured girls at the Shim Sham. Uh, a yodeler. No, a dancer. It's called a dance at the Dime Flamingo. I know. Go ahead and do it. So on that side of the family, not only did Ken have a famous mother, aunt, and uncle, he also has a half-brother from his mother's previous marriage, and his name is Joey D. Vieira. Joey was also a child actor who performed under the stage name Donald Keeler, using his mother's last name there. Now, he's famous for being on the Lassie TV show from 1954 through 1957. He was Sylvester Porky Brockway. You do this every day, Porky, and you lose some of that fat. I'd rather be fat. After Lassie, he was in movies and on television for decades. He appeared in things like The Many Loves of Dolby Gillis, My Three Sons, and in the 80s, he was in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He was the pizza man. His last appearance, though, was in the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson in 2000. In the late 70s and early 80s, he also started to put out these drum instrumental albums, Volume 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Hi, I'm Joey Vieira. What you're listening to now is called Afro-Cuban. This rhythm stems from the progressive jazz family. Every drum drop on this album uses the same basic arrangement. The chart is always written on the back of the album to read. And they got really popular as rap and hip-hop started to explode. They found these drum beats and they were sampling them. And even recently, Tyler the Creator had a hit with 911 Mr. Lonely, which uses Joey's drum beats. Now, Ken's father, William Weatherwax, was a professional dog breeder who specialized in thoroughbreds. He was also a professional dog trainer, and so were his brothers, Rudd and Frank Weatherwax. And those two owned and trained the very first Lassie that you've seen on the TV show. So now that you know his family's background and connections, let's look into the life of Ken Weatherwax. When he was five years old, his mother took him on an audition for a commercial, and he gets the part. He becomes Chester, the face of Gleam Toothpaste. He appears in three different commercials over the course of a year, and I cannot find them anywhere. If you do, link them down below so I can archive them. I did, however, find his first television appearance. It was on Wagon Train, episode The John Gilman Story. And at the end of the episode, it lists his name, and he says he played the Stout Boy, which is another term for overweight or pudgy. So, in the show, he is sat on top of the back of a grown man, but is too heavy to give a piggyback ride to. After that, Ken said that he went on a few more auditions, but nothing became of them. But when he was seven years old, his mother took him on a new audition. They were looking for a boy who was a little heavy set that looked like this picture. 
The picture was a cartoon drawing of this little boy and his family, illustrated by cartoonist Charles Adams, which his mother didn't know anything about. So when Ken showed up the first day of auditions, all they really did was just check out how he looked and made sure that he can read. The second day when he was called back, there were less kids there and he breezed through that one too. By the end of the week, they had narrowed it down to four kids for the role. On the final day of the auditions, all the kids had to read their lines through with John Aston, who would be playing their father, Gomez. And as they went through them, John also had some input with the producers on who he thought should be chosen. And he recommended Ken. So, on September 18th, 1964, Ken Weatherwax debuts as Pugsley Adams. Mother knows best. We'll send the children to school. <laughs> school? That's for kids. I'm sure the children are going to be very happy here. If we wanted them to be happy, we'd have let them stay home. That isn't all. You ought to hear some of the other stories in her book. Let me see that, darling. That settles it. No more school. Good thinking, sir. Ken said that Carolyn Jones, who played his mother on the show, was the same person when the camera was off. She was very warm and nurturing to him. Let me see your hands. Oh, excellent, Pugsley. The nails are nice and clean and sharp. He also said that John Aston was kind of like a mentor and acting coach for the children, that he would go through the lines with them two or three times before they would even turn the cameras on. And if you made a mistake along the way, he'd say, it's okay, let's start again from the top. And if you made it all the way through perfectly, he would say, excellent, fantastic, or bravo. Something very uplifting and motivating. There was never any pressure with John. Hmm? Wednesday's flown the coop. Just ran away from home. Really? I didn't run away from home until I was eight. I wonder which side of the family she got that from. Both sides. <laughs> Who's mining the reactor upstairs? I gave that to Wednesday. All that kid stuff is behind me now. What I really want is, uh... All right, now. Out with it, boy. After all, we feel towards you as if you were our own sons. <laughs> Gomez, he is. I need some money. Oh, is that all? How about a hundred a week? You don't understand. I want to work. Watch your language, boy. We Adamses haven't worked in 300 years. We'll make it 200. But, Mother, I'm not joking. I want to go to... Stop. We've heard quite enough, young man. March right upstairs to your room. Where have we failed that boy? Now, when it comes to Jackie Coogan, who played Uncle Fester on the show, Ken has a lot to say about him. First of all, the laws that were passed because of the experiences that Jackie faced as a child actor himself were fully enacted on the Adams family. Each child was required to have a parent with them while they were on set, and so most days it was Ken's mother that was there with him. Now since there were two children on the show, there also had to be a full-time social worker present during filming hours. It was also required that each child receive one-on-one -on -one education performed by a licensed teacher for three hours per day using textbooks and things like that. And this was all part of the Jackie Coogan Law. But he says it didn't stop there. Jackie was always making sure the kids were sort of like entertained or happy. And so whenever they weren't filming and didn't have anything to do, he would play board games with him and Lisa Loring, who played his sister Wednesday Adams on the show. And then whenever they were in school, and if Jackie noticed one of them was having a hard time focusing on their schoolwork, he would ask the teacher if they could take a break for a while. And during that time, he would play more games to try and get your mind out of the schoolwork and just back into happy zone. And he said one of the things that Jackie did with Ken was they liked to bounce a ball back and forth to each other. He said that Jackie was an uncle on the show, but in real life, he was like a big brother, always watching out for us. There wasn't anything going to go wrong with Jackie around. Do not be alarmed. We are only little children. <laughs> now, unfortunately, the show did come to an end on April 8th, 1966. There were 64 episodes in total filmed, 
and Ken was soon to turn 11 years old. So his mother asked him if he would like to appear on another television show. And having had such a good experience on this one, he said yes. So his agent started to shop his name and portfolio around looking for auditions. But time and time again, he was being told, sorry, we cannot use him. He's known as Pugsley and we're looking for a fresh face, which was very common for child actors. You see, being typecast as an adult actor was difficult enough. But as a child actor, once you were on a hit TV show, it was almost like you were used up. While all of this was going on, Ken's mother didn't tell him anything about it. She didn't want him to worry or have any concerns. And so it was something that he learned about later on as he got older and asked for himself. Now that fall, he went ahead and enrolled in public school. And keep in mind, he hadn't been to school in over three years. So this was going to be a new, big, exciting event for him. But it didn't exactly turn out that way. When he showed up to school, he was instantly recognized by all the kids. His looks really hadn't changed that much. Now, you would think this would be an advantage for him, help break the ice. But instead, they decided to stare and point and laugh at him, which he thought might go away after a little while. But instead, it turned mean and malicious. They would say stuff like, You were Pugsley. You were the fat one. And that started to give him a complex. By the end of the year, it was out of control. And his mother had been up there like several times about this bullying. Right around the time that everything was the most out of control at that school, Ken started to receive offers to appear in all these TV pilots. These pilot episodes are something that producers and production companies create around an idea that they have for a TV show. They actually go and film like episode one or one and two of something, and they pay seasoned veteran actors to appear in these. And when they pitch it to the networks, it's more likely to get picked up. They can see how it all plays out. And so you'll get your one-time fee for appearing in these. And hopefully, when they pitch it to the network, if it gets picked up, the network will say, keep these same actors. So they can be a really good vehicle to get on television. And some famous actors have made it all the way to superstardom by appearing in the right pilot at the right time. Now, in Ken's case, he was receiving not such a great opportunity. His mother would look over the scripts and she would see that he would be offered the role of the chubby neighbor, or in some cases, even more offensive, the fat kid. So his mother turned down all those offers. She wasn't gonna let anyone make fun of Ken. Now remember, she had an older son named Joey who played on the Lassie TV show, and his character on there was called Porky, so he battled similar issues. Now, when it came time for the new school year, Ken's mother enrolled him in a different location. She was hoping that it had been an extra year since the show had been on the air. Maybe things would be better for him. But they weren't. The kids realized he was Pugsley Adams, and this time they weren't just making fun of his weight. They started calling him dumb. Ken said, it wasn't like I was failing anything. It's just that it took me longer to do stuff because I was basically homeschooled on the set of the show and there wasn't a time limit. But now I'm sitting in a classroom where everybody has the same worksheet and it is timed. So they would get done before me and I still would only finish about 70% of the questions. And my answers were all correct, but I'd still get a low grade. And that would cause everyone to make fun of me for being dumb. Ken said at the end of the year, he asked his mother if he could change schools again, and she obliged. So this started to become a reoccurring thing in his life. He said he would enter the school, eventually they would recognize him, start to pick on him, and he would go ahead and tough it out to the next year. But he became more withdrawn each time. Now eventually he went to a school where they beat him up for being Pugsley. And so they had to change schools twice that year. And he would alternate between private and public schools wherever his mother could find a place for him that was within zoning distance or driving distance, somewhere they could accept him. And it became such a problem that he was in seven different schools by the time he was in high school. 
He said, something really changed in me over these years. I started to believe all the negative things these kids were saying about me. I had no self-esteem at all. I started to hate the way I looked. I would go ahead and starve myself without my mother knowing. I would take stuff to my room and say I was going to eat it and then throw it in the trash so that I could lose weight and maybe change my facial features in time for the new school year. And as I became a teenager, I would look in the mirror every day praying that I was able to grow a mustache or a beard, but it never happened, not quick enough. And I was just so upset every day that I had to go to school. I didn't like my looks. I was just wanting to hide from the world. He says, this broke my mother's heart. She tried everything to build up my self-esteem. She had me in counseling, but nothing worked. And eventually I dropped out of school. Then, at the age of 17, I started to feel a little bit better, and I knew that I wanted to do something positive with my life, and so I decided to join the military, but I was still too young. But my mother signed something, and at the age of 17 and a half, I was able to join the U.S. Army Cavalry as a combat recovery specialist. I felt like the military did a lot of good for me. It gave me structure, confidence, a purpose, and camaraderie. I started to feel good about myself, but after some years in there, I returned to civilian life and my old negative thoughts reappeared. Luckily, I did have a pretty good nest egg saved up from my time in the military, and I was now old enough that I was allowed to withdraw the money from the Jackie Coogan Child Actors Fund for my time on the show. And when I received my disbursement, it was $17,000. This allowed me to get an apartment and settle in. I kind of bounced around between dead-end jobs for a few years, but then I got hired by Universal Studios as a motion pictures studio grip. At first, I was just sort of a gopher and stagehand, but eventually I started to learn some trades such as carpentry and I moved into building the studio sets. There was a lot of room for advancement and I took advantage of that. I now had a good job, my own apartment, and I got a girlfriend. Things were going along really smooth. Then in 1977, I was asked to appear in a television special, Halloween with the new Adams Family. Now, up until this point, I didn't tell anyone in my life that I met or worked with that I was previously on the show and played Pugsley. I was still embarrassed, but there wasn't any way I was going to pass up this opportunity to see so many of the original cast that I always considered my friends. Dear son, welcome home from Nairobi Medical School. Thank you, Mother. I owe it all to Dr. McGumbo. Dear Dr. McGumbo, how is he? Great. Have a look. Ah. <laughs> After playing that part on the show, Ken said that he settled back into his normal daily life and never even attempted to appear on television again. Now, his normal life was considered work and his girlfriend, but eventually the two of them did split up and this brought on another depressive state for Ken. He said, I would return home to the apartment and I would be lost. I was really down. Now, I would go visit my parents all the time, but when I'm alone, I had these negative thoughts constantly. So I decided to take a different job offer with the studio. I wanted to move into the traveling part of it where you would go on location, and this meant longer hours, less free time to yourself, and more money. It was something that only a single person could do or someone trying to occupy all of their time and mind. And that was me. We would travel all around the country building these movie sets and stay there for months at a time in these little trailers that you were provided by the studios, which also allowed me to get rid of my apartment. I didn't really have a need for it. I was on the road all year, all the time never stopped. If I did have some downtime, I would be at home visiting my parents. Now, Ken says that eventually he did start hanging out with his fellow co-workers after the job was done for the day, and they would do some drinking, but it really wasn't a problem for him until around 1986, 
That's when his father passed away. After that, he said, I drank more heavily and more frequently. And then around 1990, his mother had her first stroke. And he took a couple weeks off and he was back there helping her recover. And during this time, she was very concerned that she was going to be put in a nursing home and forgotten about. And that's when he promised her he would not let that happen. If she needed him there, he would be there for her and take care of her in her home. She was not going to a nursing home. Fortunately, she did recover and was able to live on her own again, which allowed Ken to go back on the road and continue with his job. Now, he did worry about his mother constantly, he said. I was drinking heavily and thinking about her, and I had these negative thoughts about my life and who I am. I was feeling unsatisfied, unfulfilled. I didn't feel like I was really doing anything for the world. I wanted to be back there helping my mother. Now in 2002, she did have a second stroke. And this is when he had to quit his job and go back and help her because he promised. Ken said this time meant so much to both of them, but to him, it meant the world. He was able to comfort and take care of his mother in her time of need. He said, I'll never forget that. I love my mother. But sadly, a few months later, she passed away on November 11th, 2002 with Ken by her side. After this, Ken ended up living in the house for over a year by himself, just sort of cleaning it up, getting it ready for sale. And during this time, he would sort out things and find family photos, and he would pack them away in storage units along with all of his carpentry tools. Now, as this whole process continued on, Ken started to become more and more depressed. Eventually, he started to truly believe that he was all alone in this world and didn't even have a reason to live. And he knew this was a bad state of mind to be in, so he told a friend. The friend recommended that Ken get a companion such as a dog. So Ken went to the local shelter, and that's where he found Buddy, his new best friend, and a reason to continue on. Eventually, the house did sell, so it was time for Ken to move on. Now, he didn't want to go back and work for the studios and live that same old lifestyle, so he decided to take this time to see America. So he packed up the few possessions that he didn't have in storage, he loaded them into the car along with Buddy, and they set out to see the country. He said that he made it as far as New Mexico before his car broke down, and he took that as a sign that maybe he should stay there for a while because he might be able to finally find happiness. And so him and Buddy got a place to live, and he spent his days taking him for walks and just living a simple life. But every day, he was just spending money and not making any. So eventually, after a year, this really caught up and his money was getting depleted. But his car was fixed, so he headed back to California. But he didn't have a place to live out there, so he stayed with a friend on the couch. One of the first things he did was go to the storage unit to make sure everything was okay. And lo and behold, he hadn't been paying the bill and they had sold or thrown away everything that was in there. So that's why you do not find any pictures of his family or himself anywhere online, because it was all lost. So Ken said that living on the couch at his friend's house was just something that couldn't last forever. Here I am with my dog, I'm depressed, and I'm putting a lot of stress on him. So eventually I go ahead and move in with someone else on their couch and then someone else. I would wear out my welcome. I just couldn't pull things together. Desperate for a place to stay, I remembered that my half-brother's father had passed away and his house was sitting there empty on this lot. So when I showed up, it was totally abandoned and dilapidated. I snuck in and I was undetected. Actually, I could come and go as I pleased, but it was just me, buddy and I had a box of possessions that I had taken from my mother's house when I moved out and these were just random things that I had found and saved. One of them was a pistol. After a couple of days we ran out of food and I didn't have any money so I decided to end it all but I didn't know what to do about buddy. Somebody had to find him and take care of him. I wasn't worried if they ever found me. 
So I devised a plan. There was a billboard down the road that said, nobody might buy your house or sell your house, but I would, Bob would. That was his name. So I called him. My thought process was that if I set up an appointment with Bob to come take a look at this property, when he showed up, he would find Buddy and be able to take care of him. But when I called the number, his people answered and said Bob was going to be too busy to come out for over a week. I begged them, please let me talk to him before then. They said, best we can do is tell you that maybe you can run into him at church on Sunday. And I thought, that's only two days away. If I go to this church, I might be able to talk him into coming out on Monday. That would give me time to come back here, do what I have to do, and then have him find Buddy. So that Sunday morning, Ken cleaned himself up as best that he could, and he reached into his box of belongings and pulled out his mother's Bible. This Bible was only the size of the palm of his hand. So he took it with him and headed to church. When he arrived, he asked a few people if they knew who Bob was. And of course they all did because Bob was very prominent in the church. So he went ahead and took in the day's sermon and afterward he went up to talk to Bob. Ken proceeds to tell Bob that he really needs him to come out and take a look at this property tomorrow, which would be Monday. And Bob says, I'm sorry, son, I do not discuss business on Sundays. Ken then almost begins to beg. He says, please, please, can't you come out and take a look at this property tomorrow? And he hands him the piece of paper with the address on it. Again, Bob says, things don't work that fast for me, and I do not discuss things like this on a Sunday. But son, I can tell you are in a desperate situation, and I notice you have a Bible in your hand. Have you read that? Ken said that he had read some of it in the past, but cannot recall anything. That's when Bob told him, Son, I will make an exception for you. Next Sunday, we can discuss taking a look at this property of yours. But before then, you need to go read the book of Matthew. Ken said that he felt dejected when he heard that, almost as if it was a brush off. So he left out of the church kind of angry. Now, when he went back to the abandoned house, he picked up Buddy, and the two of them walked around the park. Eventually, Ken sat down under a tree while Buddy kind of walked around and played, chasing squirrels. And Ken opened up the Bible that was still in his jacket pocket, and he turned it to the book of Matthew and began to read. Before he knew it, he had spent the evening reading the Gospel of Matthew. And when he returned to the abandoned house with Buddy... He found himself unable to sleep that night. It wasn't just tossing and turning. He was up thinking. The next morning, as the sun came up, he looked over at the box of his belongings and he reached in and pulled out the pistol. But instead of using it, he took it to a pawn shop where he sold it for $50. He then took that money to the dollar store where he bought food for him and Buddy for the week. He wanted to live. The following Sunday, he returned to the church. And during the prayer and praise time of the service, he was the first one to rise to his feet and make a public confession of Christ before all the witnesses. He was then baptized by Pastor Jesse Stevens of the Chatsworth Advent Christian Church. With the help of his new family and friends in the church, he was slowly able to rebuild his life, which included letting go of any negative thoughts he had of himself or his past. In fact, one day at a church event, he set up a table and was signing autographed pictures of himself as Pugsley Adams, letting everyone know who he was. When Lisa Loring, who played Ken's sister Wednesday Adams on the TV show, found out about Ken's recovery, she contacted him, letting him know that she was very happy. She was so worried over the years for him, but didn't have any way to help him because she herself was going through a lot of struggles. This meant the world to Ken. The two of them reconnected, and eventually, he even set up a table next to hers at a few Comic-Con conventions. Sadly, on December 7th, 2014, in his home in West Hills, California, Ken suffered a heart attack and passed away. He was only 59 years old. 
Staff at the dearly departed Tours and Artifact Museum raised the money to have Ken interred at the Valhalla Memorial Park Cemetery. His memorial service was held at the Chatsworth Lake Community Church, where all his family and church friends were gathered. In attendance were Lisa Loring, who played Wednesday Adams, Butch Patrick, who played Eddie Munster, Paul Peterson, who played Jeff Stone on The Donna Reed Show, and many of his co-workers with the Actors Guild Union. While making this video, it makes me want to say his life ended too soon. But instead, I'm going to say I'm happy he lived long enough to find that peace and happiness that he was always searching for. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, think about giving it a like or subscribe. That helps you find this channel again in the future. You may also want to check out some of my other Adams Family videos. There will be a link on the screen right now. I'm also going to make a really short video because it's a cool story on Ken's uncles and their dog Lassie. That video will be on the screen right now and linked in the first comment. Cool classics.